peces somorfes con da crayasmos. one of the most beautiful untouched islands and because my grandparents came from there it really does tug at your heart I just thought oh, well, it would be nice to go to the island but I didn't think that I'd become so emotionally uh, overcome as I was the adults suddenly um, went wild and, and uh, uh, started screaming and crying and, and pointing and Castellorizion is a person who comes from Castellorizio and stays there. If you're not a Castellorizion, of course you're a foreigner. <laughs> Hello, I'm Theo Penglis, and I'm an Australian. And like most Australians, my family comes from somewhere else. In their case, a far-flung rock in the Aegean Sea an island that has remained so passionately Greek despite its turbulent history. A tiny piece of earth called Castellorizo. The most eastern point of Europe, it is officially called Megisti, a legacy of its involvement in the Trojan War. Over the centuries, Castellorizo has been coveted and conquered by many nations. During the Crusades, one of its ancient fortresses was rebuilt. And since then, the island has been known by the Italian name for Red Castle, Castellarosso, Castellorizo. Because of its strategic position and safe harbor, it built a strong merchant navy and established itself as a prosperous center of commerce. By the end of the 19th century, it boasted a population of 14,000 people with its own public education and health systems. But then things started to decline. The advent of steam allowed ships from other islands to become more competitive, and the continual tension under Turkish rule began to take its toll. The Castellarisian people began to look for somewhere else to live. Those islands in the, in the Mediterranean, in the Aegean, that in fact were fertile islands. Uh, the people actually tilled the soil and they remained on their island. The ones where there was an infertile land had to seek their fortune elsewhere. They must have been so clear on what countries, what cities um, were the best that offered most opportunities. And I think once the, the sailing fishing industry started to decline with steam, um, I think they had to find another place to go to, and quickly. And I think Australia was, was, um, 
was one of the top options. They went everywhere, to the neighboring islands, Athens, Russia, Britain, Egypt, South America, and many headed for the United States. The greatest part, the fantastic part, and the heart of the Castellorisians has moved since 100 years now uh, in Australia. And uh, the Castellorisian heart is beating in Australia. The first um, documented Castellorisian to arrive here um, was Arthur August, the Fanasio of Rusti. Um, and he arrived here, well, there is, there is some dispute, but he seems to have arrived here in 1890, 1891, landing at Broome uh, before making his way down to Perth and proceeding across to Adelaide, and then came back here shortly after that. And um, he's, he's regarded as um, sort of the founding father, I suppose, of the Castellarisian um, community here. And as I could re recollect, my father telling me about that scene, that emotional scene when the first mass exodus of young people leaving the island, when everyone was on those wharves and there was colourful parades and all this, they were going to now uh, wish these young people who were heading for a land of hope. And the young people were only uh, teenagers, early twenties, leaving behind their mothers, their sisters, their wives and heading for probably the longest trip that they'd ever been on. When I was born in Castellari Zoria in uh, 1913 and we had the a disturbance with the text in 1915 uh, I think it was and then we finished up going to Piraeus, stayed there from then on to about 1922 and we come back to the island 22. 23 my father left to go to Australia to take me auntie over there and then they uh, come back in 26 I think it was the time we had the earthquake here and then after then uh, uh, we arrived to we only had an auntie in, in Castellorizo we couldn't stop with them, like, because they, you know, they, they, they want to go away themselves too as well. And uh, we asked them to turn around to be aunties in uh, Australia and America, had an auntie there too as well. Uh, and the visitors come over from Australia first, and that's the reason we went over to Australia. My father left the island in 1914 because of the war and uh, he came out to Australia and of course uh, his occupation here was on the boats and he was diving uh, and he found out when he got to Perth that he could make good money by going to Darwin and diving there for a living uh, and getting somewhere around a pound an hour and after that uh, he went to Innisfield where he was cutting sugar cane and uh, developed some very strong forearms I understand he could uh, strike a wax match on his forearm, he was that strong. And then from there, he went to Western Australia and was working uh, in the timber mills. He married mum um, in uh, his early 20s. I think he was 22 or 23 when he got married. And uh, he bought from a cousin of his uh, a cafe in the central city. The cousin uh, forgot to tell him there was no um, lease on this cafe. So he was... Um, rudely awakened about six months later when he was evicted so he went back to what he knew best and that was timber cutting and again built up a kid he came back a much wiser man he didn't come back into the city he went into a place called Mayland a suburb of uh, Perth and uh, he started that was his start in the fish business my father predominantly came to Australia because uh, they were devastated after the first world war and uh, he was involved in uh, uh, in the course of his activities uh, as a captain, uh, he had been to Asia Minor at the time when there was an uprising in Asia Minor and uh, he in fact attempted to rescue a number of people uh, at a bay that's just north of uh, Smyrna. And uh, he managed with a hundred people to sort of uh, 
uh, try and get out of the bay. He was actually torpedoed, but managed to escape that, got out of the bay and thought he was safe, but the Turkish fleet was waiting for him actually outside. Anyway, they were finally captured and he lost his ship and uh, he was supposed to be, uh, uh, to be executed. Uh, he, in fact, had to face a, an international court because he was, in fact, a captain. Uh, but the death sentence was, uh, was pronounced. Uh, as it turned out, though, the, one of the, the Turkish uh, people who, with whom he had been trading previously had a very high regard for my father. I mean, he was a very staunch Greek, my father. And uh, he rescued him uh, insofar as he enabled him to escape uh, after he was uh, supposed to be executed. Anyway, he, he lost everything and so came to Australia subsequently. When he first got to Australia, because they all had to do all the dirty jobs. He, he, he worked in a mine for seven years and he watched all his mates dying and the poisonous gases and the, and the, the cave-ins. And... He was working for the Greeks in, uh, in the mid bar there because he couldn't get a job in any Australian place present at the time because they used to be, we used to be foreigners and they wouldn't give us a job. When the first Greek in Australia, they couldn't speak English, they have no any trade. So the only easy thing they find is to make a fish and chips, put the family together, work. We never had fish and chips in Greece. Well, I think they come from England, didn't they? Now they have fish and chips in Greece, from Australia. In 1933, I couldn't get a job anywhere, so I had to go and work with my uncle, uh, catching prawns which is we caught the prawns and uh, we used to sell them in the markets. So sometimes you get a kerosene tin, sometimes you get a half. But this particular day we finished up getting eight kerosene tins on the weekend was Saturday night. And uh, when I, we got them, I didn't want to dump them, I just took the whole thing. They helped me put them on the train. And then after that I had to turn around and uh, taken from the roads uh, where we were in the in Parramatta River, I had to take them to the railway. From the railway I had to take them in a tram into the quay, Sackler Quay like, and then from the Sackler Quay I had to cross over the ferries to Manly Wharf, go over to Manly, and from Manly I had to go to Narrabin, which is, uh, I guess, I think it's about 20 miles out, more than 20 miles. I had uh, two in each hand, and uh, I had a streak around the, uh, the the other four, two in each arm, uh, shoulders. And I carried it for the eight carosintids. I sold them and I got three pounds, the whole lot. That's the six dollars more than anything else these days. <laughs> It's a sort of a secondary migration really. The Western Australians come up to Darwin because there's well paid work, no one else wants to do it. Then they bring people out, then they bring their own people out. We were going to the Western Australia where my father was working. He said, we finished there, we are sent to Darwin, come to Darwin, Northern Territory. It was 1916. Well you could say probably the first uh, Castellarisian man out here was a, uh, a beach de Mur, uh, fisherman basically, uh, someone who's a, a Cassie who had a, uh, a cousin worked for the Germans. This is going back to 1890 and he would have used Thursday Island and Darwin as the main port. So that's probably the first uh, contact but he wasn't living in Darwin. They really begin coming in uh, large numbers from 1914 on. Seven Castellarisian men come from uh, Perth and come to Darwin in 1914 aboard the steamship. Many of them were lighter men, which I suppose is a traditional job. In other words, they were the people that carried cargo from the big boat to the shore, especially in uh, where there's a big tidal difference. Others did work in uh, government hotels here. Others worked on the railway line, which they were building uh, from south up to Darwin to carry the uh, cattle and so on. Um, others worked on the wharves. In fact, they were involved in an industrial dispute in 1916. Uh, the Tamisino police had given my father and all the rest of the people that waited for their families to come, which we arrived, and he's given them the permission to build the huts and stay there temporarily till such time they save up enough, buy a block, Neocopedo, and Nachtisus Piti. 
and build a house. And that happened. Happened to a father, mother, and my father, and mother, and I saw we were very obliged. I suppose basically the, the fortunes of the Castellarison community here sort of uh, live and die with this uh, Vestis Meatworks. And Vestis gave the impression that they were going to do wonderful things, but in fact a lot of their aims and objectives were tied up with the war. So 1917 you have a double wedding in, uh, in Darwin. A Greek priest is brought up from uh, Western Australia and is convinced to stay on as the, uh, the priest. So I suppose 1917 marks the time when you've got probably about four, close to 400 Greek residents, you know, may, all, most of them from Castel Orizo. And uh, they've got two places where they're living, Greek Town, which is now Doctors Gully, and Salonika, which is where the, the railway came in from south and then branched off to the meatworks. Once this meatworks closed in 1920, Darwin went back to what it was, you know, just a frontier town uh, with really nothing going for it. And most of the of that community, let's say, uh, it's very hard to fix a figure, but let's say there's around about 400. Most of them either went back to Perth or down to Innisvale in northern Queensland where they'd already been doing some seasonal work as cane cutters. We were all born in Ingham, in Queensland. Mother was married in, in, in Queensland and she had seven children in Queensland, six girls, one boy. I'm number five. Dad arrived in Australia in 1903 and mother in 1922. Somebody told her that she would make a fortune in Darwin because she was such a worker. So she bought six girls and a little boy up to Darwin in 1937. We've been here ever since. Everybody that spoke to Mother said that she would be st stupid to open a business where she was opening because of, um, I think, in those days, the roughness of the Northern Territory. The men were very rough. There weren't quite a lot of women up here. And um, she was game enough. She opened uh, 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 the Great Star Cafe. The reception, as uh, I recall, in uh, in a number of stories that I've heard, was enormous. You know, you, it was almost a, 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 a party at the Castor Region Club each time a family arrived, you know? And we learn about the, the island and the little politics that happens and the social gossip that's happening. It was as if they were back, as, and, and it boosted their morale, it boosted their, uh, uh, their hopes. The Castor Region Club was first established as a brotherhood in New South Wales in 1924. It was set up by a team of a few dedicated Castor Regions as a centre to provide assistance and uh, employment for the many Castor Regions that had arrived in this country. Until 1950, they met in a small uh, cafe down at the city. It was the Confus Cafe. And this was their meeting place. It was predominantly male, as you could appreciate, and they talked about the old days. Uh, their limited time, of course, because uh, they worked many hours, and for those few hours that they could steal to get together, play cards, and talk about the old days, was an event in itself. <laughs> Κάποιο παιδί σιγά σιγά στα σκοτεινά Ένα στόχο σπίτου τίποτα σταματάει Και με λακτάρα ψιθυρίδι σιγά
As the cases were becoming more established in Australia and things began to prosper, life on the island was becoming more difficult. Their independence from Turkey short-lived. They were now under Italian control. Uh, the Italian people are very polite, very, very nice people, but uh, when the ruler is uh, Mussolini, uh, you cannot judge the people. They close the churches, the schools, we have to, to speak the Italian, to, to believe to, to their own la uh, religion, you know, it's not different to so all Christians. We were forced as, as, uh, as school children to um, join the uh, fascist movement. And in fact, I was a balilla. Uh, this is the lowest denomination in the, in the fascist rank. Um, at the same as there were all the other boys and girls that they were in my class. And uh, we had to uh, sing all the fascist songs and, uh, and everything else that uh, Mussolini then was dictating to the, to the education system. Uh, the churches, uh, all colors have been taken off, change the coloring of the house, the blue, take the blue house, blue color hair, painted in dark uh, gray. I was a little boy and I was very happy when during the night I was looking my uh, granny to have a piece blue and white uh, clothes and that was only to remind us this is the colors of the Greek flag. Don't forget ever and I never forget it. The more that we were suppressed, the more the, the cultural um, uh, identity was cultivated at home and uh, and made sure that it was preserved. <laughs> so in a way it was self, what the uh, Mussolini was trying to do really, was a self-defeating uh, uh, exercise. When war was finally declared, the Italian troops occupied the island. My father, who was uh, an owner uh, of, uh, of a kaiki, or a, sh uh, a ship, a two, uh, mast ship, um, he was caught, so to speak, in Cyprus. And imagine uh, a woman with seven children to feed, and and nothing, no income of any kind. So my my poor mother had to uh, do all sorts of things: sell her jewelry, uh, take in washing. Uh, I remember very vividly, time and time again, when I used to go to the Italian soldiers and ask them to leave me a little bit of soup in their plate, and I would wash their plate. We used to produce a bread only for the military soldiers and officers. 250 grams bread a day. And uh, for the inhabitants, it was a half kilo of flour for one week. And it's not only that, the fishing was completely prohibited. 1941. Six o'clock in the morning, we hear about a few noises and bullets and rifles. So we are young people, young men, and just get out to see what's going on. And we saw soldiers, and they talk different to the Italian language. And they took the island in a matter of minutes. I was walking near the, the uh, seashore and there was an Italian soldier that I knew and he was shot dead and half of his body was in the water and half of his body was uh, uh, out of the water and it was absolute silence and the only thing I could remember uh, it was his watch, his wristwatch ticking and that's an experience that I will never forget in my life I, I have to be honest and say I was tempted to take the watch as a young boy because I never had a watch in my, myself ever in my life and uh, and when I bent down to do it I couldn't do it I got frightened I ran away <laughs> three days later the British left the Italian troops returned there was vast amounts of ammunition uh, left on the island I remember quite vividly kids were playing with hand grenades I have a cousin who blew himself to pieces. He found a, a shell in, in the harbor and he got it out, started playing around with it, and he blew himself up. One day, 
we saw two Spitfires and they very very low and they opened a fire with a machine gun he's been killed one boy age about 18 years old he was coming the poor boy to get to protect the shell to the my bakery where we used to work for the Italian soldiers and in the meantime he caught him on the spot on the door as he walks in and he cut in half that was the first invasion and of course the, the second one in 1943 in September when Italy surrendered and we were the first island to be uh, liberated it was like uh, Pascha, Easter was sound the, the bells of the church uh, the Greek and uh, New Zealand and Australian and British flag everywhere in balconies don't ask me where they found it from everyone used to have them captain me because we knew it one day Castellosa would be free by the Allies we knew it Although the British forces remained this time, celebrations were short-lived, as it was the Germans now who were bombing the island. I remember that I was sitting on the balcony with my father. The British were here, and they had given us some bread, and my father mashed it all up into a dough and cooked us pies in an oven. While we were eating them on the balcony, we saw 11 German planes, and the bombing started. The next day, a man called Manolis Fundas, an Italian citizen, but a very good man helping everybody, went knocking on the doors of every house, saying, get ready quickly, you'll be going to Cyprus in a Navy ship, because Castellorizo will be turned into an army base. The people were upset, but we could not do otherwise. They forced us into a big British ship, and they took us to Rhodes, I, I mean Cyprus. I know we had a bad time getting there. There was the danger of sinking, because there were mines in the sea, and we had two submarines escorting us, just in case. And unfortunately, we left everything, the houses closed, with all the good for antiques and all this we had all so many years. And we've been staying there for two years in the Middle East, up to 1945. And we hear the news from the BBC London, up to the Middle East, down there in Gaza, in Ujarat. Castellarizo is still in flames for 30 days, day and night with 200 meters high flames. Rumor has it it was the English. They got drunk and set alight one house. As it happened, there was a strong wind and the houses being attached to each other got burnt. All their interiors were burnt and only the walls were standing. To give work to the people and to keep them from leaving the island, they pulled them down. And then God had something more for the Castellorizians. We know that it was just by luck, but uh, the last ship, and uh, which was about 300 uh, Castellorizians, has to return back to Dodecanese, to Rhodos, and then to Castellorizo, was sunk about 60 miles from Alexandria. When my mother and I went to bed, we heard shouts. We came up on deck and saw fire. My mother couldn't go back downstairs, so I went to get the life jackets that they had given us. All the people had their money and things under their pillows, but we didn't have time to go downstairs to help some old women. They got burnt. I went to get the life jackets. On my way upstairs, at a doorway, there were flames. I put the life jackets on my head and I lunged forward and I got out unharmed. I found my father and I noticed he had taken off the wooden toilet seats for us to use as life boys. It was a tragic mo moment to see your friends and your people, you know, to die, to burn, and the uh, sharks, a lot of sharks, to, to complete the catastrophe. Everyone was in the water. Most of the victims were decapitated by the lifeboats, and I think there were two to three babies among them. My sister was rescued, and I rescued her eight-days-old baby. 
I, I gave it my saliva to drink because the baby almost died in the 24 hours. The Australians gave us milk and a feeding bottle and I fed it. They also cut up some blankets and I wrapped it up. In 1947, the United Nations General Assembly, with Australia's Doc Everett as president, met to redefine European boundaries. Finally, after centuries of foreign rule, Vassilorizo was officially returned to Greece. But the jubilation could not compensate for the devastation that this island had suffered. Once again, many of the inhabitants decided to join the compatriots in Australia. Since the war, those who came after the war, their experiences were different. They've been um, in Greece longer, uh, and the impact of the Second World War itself and uh, the the fact that they had to virtually flee the island, become refugees, that made their experiences different to a lot of their predecessors. I know our family resented the fact of the migration in the 50s from Greece. You know, like my grandmother used to say things like, they get it easy, they got beds to sleep in. When we arrived, we had fruit cases to sleep in, you know. And I think because they'd been here, they'd already established an identity as the Greek takeaway or the Greek restaurant owner. At school, when I started going to school, there were no Greeks at school, just me. And I was known as the fish and chip shop kid, you know. I wasn't known as the Greek or the Wog. I started to be called Wog when the migrants, when all the migrants came after the war in the, in the 50s. So I think the Kazis resented migration from Greece because they'd been here and they'd established themselves and, and all of a sudden they were lumped in with the, uh, with the migrants again. There was nothing that we had in common. Uh, we were still very much Greek. Uh, we were still interested in uh, soccer, which was regarded at the time as a, as a foreign sport. Uh, we were still interested in Greek music. Uh, the Castoresians who were born here uh, were really not into that. So the younger set of my days was really uh, them and us. But my observation today says that the young people of today, the young Castoresians, and some of them are gen second generation, are far more aware and far more interested about their background and their roots than uh, the young people of my generation that were here. And that is an encouragement, because I believe uh, it is getting stronger rather than weaker. All islands sort of stick together. Yeah. Like we might yeah. be the Kazis, then you have the Katherians and the Cypriots, they all just seem to stick to get their own islands, islands and their own groups. Yeah. And it's very hard to integrate everyone. Everyone's got their different... We still have our close knit of Kazis that we know we can rely on them for, our, for support all the time. Our parents, even our fa mothers and fathers, like, as soon as we were born, it used to be like, we're going to the Kazi club to have dinner. We'll sit down, <laughs> go downstairs into the foyer and have dinner before it was being fixed up. Um, and then they used to enroll us into Greek dancing. It's we've heard it from from the beginning of the from the beginning of it yes yeah, yeah. 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 I, I was along I was in Chicago several years ago at a trade fair with my cousin um, who had flown up we both went on to <laughs> Chicago together and this company that we were going to do business with one of the sales reps happened to be a Greek girl and she insisted that we go back to her house for for dinner and as it turned out her uh, <coughs> father um, was was from Kazi and. Uh, we, we, it was incredible just being on the other side of the world, meeting someone who had the same uh, love and affection for an island that we had sort of grown up with. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good feeling. Yeah. dusk of bygone joys I see you, my lovely island, little island of my parents, and to the accompaniment of the desolate lapping of the waves, with my soul's ear and my deep yearning, I hear the lyrics of your great song, my lovely island, little island of my parents, you have grown tired and old with me, 
Your light goes out like the stars at dawn and like the love of the world in my soul waiting for the sun to shine in brilliance. developed and evolved in a Western civilization and the roots of Western civilization were in Greece over 5,000 years. So we do have advantages because we are in a Western culture in Australia. But we do have what I would call European ideals of family, of uh, industry, of the worthiness of education, of uh, humanity, generosity. And I think these have all contributed to our prosperity. I think parents realised early in life that they, they couldn't achieve much themselves in Australia except for the accumulation of wealth in terms of education or r rising in uh, positions of status or prestige. And so they saw education as a way for their kids to do it. And there's a lot of pressure on kids to become doctors and lawyers. It was very much, look, uh, we're doing this for you. We really want you to get, get on and get ahead in the world and so on. We don't want you to have to live a life that we've uh, lived in part and all of that. It was very much at obtaining um, security rather than status that they were really looking for. And uh, I might joke about being a doctor, but I think every Cassie's uh, mother uh, wants him, not her, to be uh, like Jewish mothers do when they be a doctor. I was very fortunate. I was also pretty determined, but I was very fortunate in that I was the youngest in the family and the family really wanted to see their youngest, were I male, female, or whatever, uh, to succeed, and they were prepared to support me. It's difficult, though, in, in some families, where, particularly with the women, uh, because the boys are about to do almost anything they like, uh, but, uh, but the women tend to be a lot more restricted. Uh, I think that is changing. Uh, certainly, there must be a continuation of that in some areas, but I hope uh, that again, not by setting rigid rules, but by doing what I do, that some young women will feel, well, you know, she has done it, why can't we do the same thing? And I would hope that that would be a sort of an example. I haven't done this consciously, but I would, I would hope that that is the case. I think it must be almost impossible to be a Cassie woman, because uh, a lot of them are extremely tough, extremely bright and cunning, but they've expected to play a certain role in life. And, uh, I think that's denying them their full advancement. I know in our case, for instance, when uh, my sister um, went on the study at university, uh, that wasn't a real option with my mother. And we got together and said, look, she either does it or uh, you can say goodbye. <laughs> and she went to university, did uh, accountancy, and uh, is going extremely well now. There's no regrets. But we just had to break that uh, perception of what any Cassie girl could or should do. I think it's very important to be able, as a human being, to fulfil your own interests and desires. I mean, that makes you a, a more, a happier individual, let's put it that way. It's also, I think, very important to, if you get married and if you have children, to adopt that as a very, very serious part of your career. And so I have two careers. I have the career as a wife and mother, and I have a career as a dermatologist. You uh, have interviewed a number of uh, uh, entrepreneurs, industrialists, uh, professional people in Australia. I represent the academics. The academics, just in Perth, are quite numerous and again disproportionate. We have four full professors, Professor Mark Libris of Curtin University, Professor John Papadimitrio of the Department of Pathology, UWA, who had was given a personal chair, a very high honour. Professor Con Michael, who's Professor of Obstetrics and Gynaecology of uh, UWA, currently President of the Australian College of Obstetrics and Gynaecology. We have the Kalis brothers, who are Associate Professors of Dentistry and uh, in Pharmacy. So we also have within us, in this fire in our belly, the academic ideal, the search for knowledge, uh, the idea that creativity is the highest 
aim of any person. Given a satisfactory, a suitable background culture, then one should strive to be within a creative environment. And creativity is at the very top of the pinnacle, and we're driven by that great force. And that doesn't need any explanation, because that is being Greek, full stop. I'm from a village near Previsa and made my journey to Castellorizo via Mytilene and Kos. I was curious to see at first hand how these people live so close to Turkey. It's a space. It's a small theatre. No, it's a, it's a vast theatre. In the summertime, a play is staged during the tourist season, and in the winter, only its guards are left behind. I came here as a painter. In 1981, I started sculpting. I put a lot of emphasis on sculpture, and I put painting aside for a while. That's what I've been doing up to now, and especially now. Last year, an Italian friend, Ricardo, died. I wanted to create something in Castellorizo, and as things turned out, I'm sculpting a tombstone for his grave. That monastery was it was built around about 1756 by a blind monk who had come from um, Jerusalem. He originated from the island of Kefalonia. He had lost his uh, his sight, by the way, his, uh, when he was only about uh, four or five years old. He became a saint eventually, Saint Anthimos. Anthimos traveling all the way by himself on a small boat from Jerusalem direct to this island. It's miracle, miraculous. After he had come here, he asked to be led to a small monastery. That means that before this monastery, well, there was another small monastery, so he expanded the, the, the monastery, built walls around it and uh, turned it into a proper monastery. Uh, which was uh, awarded special rights by the Ecumenical Patriarch. While he was building uh, this monastery, he wanted to have water, of course. While digging, he saw that there was some, uh, a small cave there, which he turned uh, into a small church, say church, uh, in, uh, in memory of Saint Haralambos.
Στο πάνω μάνα το χωριό Στο πάνω μάνα το χωριό Στο πάνω μάνα το χωριό Στην εκκλησιά πιο πέρα Μου έχει πληγώσει την καρδιά Μια σκύρα στην καρδιά Η μητέρα κράτησε στην είναι μητριαρχικός λαός. Η μητέρα κράτησε στην αγκαλιά. As I already said, they are a matriarchal society. The mother held in her bosom her children and her husband because when he was away on ships for months, she was the queen of the house, its foundation and its support, literally. I don't think uh, anyone can honestly deny that the, the tougher characters in the Kazi community are the women, are the mothers, the grandmothers. Never uh, forget the toughness my grandmother had. She just seemed to be that a rock solid uh, person who you just had to please. And even though we didn't spend much time with her, she uh, took off and lived with uh, cousins in Sydney um, when I was at an early age. But that influence was there. We'd get the letters, we'd get uh, presents, we'd go and see her, and, and so on. Um, but she was pers very per persuasive and pervasive in the way the family uh, operated. I know old women now who are and they just, you know, the strength and the passion about them is, is just wonderful. I think there was a kind of sophistication because they have traveled or they have seen people that have traveled and they collected things from all over the world, from this area, from the east and the near east and, and the, you know, North Africa. So I think uh, the fact that they, they uh, felt uh, very uh, much at home here, but in touch with the outside. I, f I feel that uh, women have in common with women everywhere, something, of course. Um, I, I know very well my th Thea, Chrissy, the, the fact that she's uh, persevered for so long, I think, uh, independently. Uh, she was married. Her husband died about 15, 16, 17 years ago. But I admire this quality that she can exist and has a great inner strength through her connection with the church and her connection with her animals, her goats, her chickens, you know. And uh, I think all of these things, the people, the church, and the, the animals, uh, make her very much a total person. She watches the news, she has a television set, so she is no fool in terms of what is going on. She was very, very fanatic about the house. She was very clean, and uh, she used to cook very many things and many specialties from the island. And also she used to, to embroider to very much. So she was very strict with me. She was always shouting that I would never <laughs> learn how to be a good wife. <laughs> but then it seems I did. <laughs> She'd read to me and she, they just showed that affection. They, you know, they love their grandkids around them all the time. My parents used to work very close to where my grandmother lived and so I used to stay at my grandmother's when they used to work and so I spent a lot of time with my grandmother and then uh, when her health took a bad turn she was living in the same uh, house so I, I sort of was brought up with her um, and we had a pretty good relationship and uh, she used to um, you know, talk a lot in Greek and have her own uh, what could you say, old Greek ways, and I suppose I um, became aware of those. Our generation, at least, the grandparents are the last ones that came from the from island the itself. Island, yeah. Yeah. So they're actually directly connected to yeah. it, and yeah. they're the last source of yeah. original information. Yeah. She used to sing Kazi songs and tell us Kazi story, Tsaka Tsaka Tomaheri, and all these vicious sort of children's stories where the grandmother killed their grandchildren and put them under the ground and they the ghosts would haunt her for the rest of her life. And 
my grandmother was a great songwriter. She'd sing Manahara, Manahara, and she'd make up the songs for each particular wedding. Manahara, 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 Mejali. My father was engaged to my mother before she was born. It, it was sort of taken for granted that each uh, Cassie boy would marry a Cassie girl. Uh, that wasn't the case in our family, but uh, when I met my wife-to-be, um, I had an aunt say to me, hey, don't you realise that she's a Xeni, which of course is a foreigner. I just blended in. I love the Cassie way, so that was it, you know. In fact, some my, my people tell me I'm more Cassie than the actual Cassies. The Greeks themselves sort of had rankings, <laughs> and of course, Castellarians tended to be up the top. Um, certain islanders, the islands in close proximity, like Rhodes, for instance, you know, they, they were tolerable. Uh, and the further away you moved, um, <laughs> the less desirable was the Greek. But of course, if you didn't marry a Greek, then that was even. You know, at the start, at least, it was very difficult. In fact, it was quite traumatising because I was young and um, I wanted more than anything to be accepted. And I wasn't simply because, or mainly because, of um, the region that my parents came from, which was northern Greece. Uh, and I was referred to as the Makedona in rather uh, derogatory sort of uh, undertones, with derogatory undertones. and. Um, this was very difficult because uh, at that time I was so looking forward to the main event, the big event, which was marrying the, the person I loved and vice versa. And uh, the pressure all from all around, not just the immediate family but from relatives as well, was that um, she's not right for him, um, she's not the person that uh, he should end up with, it's not on. So um, that was why it was particularly difficult for myself and for my parents, who, uh, for whom it was quite uh, devastating, um, humiliating even, because to them I was, uh, I was their daughter, I was everything. The pressure to stay at home before marriage, to not leave home for boys and girls, very strong, and to go from that protected home environment into a marriage situation to a Kazi girl, uh, into a, another Cassie family, it, uh, you never get a chance to break out of it. You know, I had to go through it all and sort of divorce and try and find myself at the age of 30, 31, 32 again before I realised that I was in a stream of progress that I had no control over. That society, the Cassie community, the family was saying what I should do. You know, I, I finished high school. Um, I should go to university. I finished university, I should get a good job. I've got a good job, I should get a good Greek wife. I've got a good Greek wife, I should buy a house close to mum and dad so that if the kids come along, you know, we've got some babysitters already there close by. When my family was evacuated in uh, Gaza through some of these relatives of my wife went to see all those Greek refugees in Gaza. And my mother saw the one of those girls and she wrote to me that uh, I have a nice girl which is from a good family, we're educated, she speaks about four or five languages. And I thought, uh, all right. And I wrote to her, to my mother and said, all right, I agree to get engaged now. I am writing to you with your photograph in front of me. It has been exactly one month since I made my decision to join my life with you. Like everyone, I have my faults, but I promise you that I will give you my heart and that my only aim will be to make you happy. Every time I read your letters, I am filled with a feeling of love I've never felt before. Maybe because we haven't met, our hearts feel closer through letters. I cannot offer you riches, but my wealth is a good and happy heart and my attention and devotion to you will make you happy. I am not one of those who believes that happiness depends on material wealth. Your love and our happiness is all the wealth I can ever wish for.
Why well, fish? Because uh, fish, we were brought up in fish. I mean, from a child, I was in the fish shop uh, with my father, uh, watching what he was doing. And then I went, he, he wanted me not to perhaps go through the, the turmoil that my brothers went through, whereby they worked in the shop whether they liked it or not. He wanted to educate me and make me into a doctor or a lawyer. Uh, but I uh, came to a realism later that being in the fish business was an advantage. Uh, not only an advantage, I, I really do enjoy it. And I found from travelling all over Australia, particularly if I went to Sydney to the Sydney markets, the smell of the fish was, would excite me. And I'd think this is something uh, special. I and mean, this is something, this is, which my, my father used to say that the smell of fish is the smell of gold. His vision was, um, uh, I, I think, the fact that in 1956, he bought uh, a property in, in Cleaver Street in West Perth. That was a move from the back of the shop, which was, you know, about 200 square metres. All of a sudden, two acres uh, of factory and, uh, and offices. And, uh, and I think that, uh, yes, I think that he could see that there was... The, the industry is, is referred to as a very virile one. It's a, it's a very exciting industry. There's always things happening in it, and it certainly keeps you on your toes all the time. And I think that he certainly knew that, and uh, he felt that there was a great future in the industry. I didn't really thought that the time was going to come as big as it did, but at the same time I can see at the present moment, and the present moment is, is getting bigger all the time because uh, the people who let out of the process the fish, which is years ago, they didn't know how to. You buy the whole fish, and you've got to clean it up where? You've got no space to clean it. Now, you can do it the other way. You've got to, you've got to, they've got the saw, just cut them up in cutlass and get a portion of whatever you want. Same with the fillets. One time, we used to have a 10 kilo block fish all together. Now, what they do in, they put in the leaves, what they call, and you only got to knock it down with frozen, and all the, all, the, all the pieces separate, and you take whatever you've got to five portions of the fish you want, all separate and you cook it and you do your work. The other part of the block, you put it back to the freezer, any time you want it again, you do the same thing. You saw the whole fish there. Well, not only person can't buy that, but now you can buy it in uh, portion uh, pieces, which is you'll be able to tear around, take them to your flat or anywhere at all, and just flour it and cook it straight away. I enjoy going to Castelorizo very much, and I can go back every year. Uh, and I can easily spend a month there with no problem at all. Uh, what uh, attracts me there is the fact that it's my birthplace, is the fact that it offers peace and quiet from the uh, busy uh, life that we lead here in Australia. Uh, it, uh, it even allows you to uh, have an inward search, if you like, and, 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 and ponder and contemplate and, and, and think um, of the future of, of, of life and, and give you the opportunity to swim in its crystal clear waters and breathe the uh, nice and clear air and the atmosphere there. And to be amongst those people there who I admire very much, those Castellorisians who have chosen to stay there, and they are to be commended. The proximity to Turkey worries me. It worried me more when I visited the opposite Turkish coast this time that it would have that it worried me when I used to go frequently when I was a kid. It was it was it was part of the fact that we are next to Turkey and and that's it. Uh, whereas now having grown up and knowing the problems and the difficulties that exist between the two countries. 
then one looks at the, that problem in a different light. They have very good connection in between them because it is necessary to have a connection. Sometimes when the boat is not coming, they need a doctor. So they find it very close. This place over there is now it's very busy. So even if it's our neighbor is busy, we are busy also. And now it's possible, I mean, to have a daily trip from Turkey. Before it was not possible. And also the people from Turkey, I still believe they, they also uh, feel friends uh, with the Castellorisian people because they exchanging uh, products as well. They have uh, necessities and uh, they only know their necessities. So they have very good uh, relations in between them. With the common market uh, coming in uh, to Greece, uh, I think that uh, Greece has to decide whether, they're, whether they will be the tourist element for the common market. Uh, and if they will be, how will they do it most successfully? Tourism is the most important. As you know, all the world, all the world today are working for the tourism. The tourism has become an, an international industry. And everybody looks after the tourism. And try to increase the tourism and to give a, a quality of tourism. It's very good for the island. Because first of all, they bring uh, the money here, the dollars. So it is a kind of a life, a movement in the island, an interest for all these uh, restaurants. Also, it is a life for the island. So it's something nice for them to see some people smiling, new people, to be in contact with uh, people, which is uh, young and nice and um, brings here an interest. So they feel important. I mean, I feel also important because I'm coming here because I meet these wonderful people. For me, this is wonderful. Because they show me, they give me a lesson that money is not necessary. Because we live like a small millionaires here. This is what I think. Without spending much money, we live like millionaires. What do you think the millionaires do? They go in a small, isolated island and go into So I feel the same. <laughs> I would prefer to have limited uh, tourist trade, just enough to support uh, its economy through tourism and that all of the Castelorisians now in the diaspora should band together as they do through the Castelorisian Brotherhood and support the island. It is well and good to say that let's establish a community uh, hall where we can have our functions etc but you cannot provide that and be able to fund uh, projects to a large extent unless you have uh, revenue of the nature that you're getting through paper machines and, and liquor. The club today has a great range of activities. It, it, it ranges from cultural in the sense of uh, teaching the young people how to, to dance uh, uh, traditional dances which uh, is held here once a week and they range from six-year-olds to adults and uh, we teach uh, non-Greeks Greek, the Greek language uh, we have uh, bingo nights for the elderly. Uh, uh, we have uh, various uh, exercise classes. Uh, on Friday nights, we normally have this uh, disco. And on Saturday nights, we have uh, what we term family nights, which are uh, cabaret nights where we provide a very reasonable entertainment and, uh, and meals, etc. The Ladies Auxiliary was established in 1952 and their role in 1952 was to maintain our traditions and our culture and be the backbone to the uh, youngest set uh, to, and to the, uh, the men's committee, very much in the, mat uh, the matriarchal society that we're used to. And in their greatest achievement is the uh, building, the establishment of a nursing home. Uh, that was a magnificent achievement uh, because it took a lot of money, a lot of effort. Uh, but we felt that there was something had to be done uh, to provide a, a, a nursing home for the elderly people, even though the Greek people tend to feel uh, a little reserved about leaving their parents and grandparents uh, to go to nursing homes. We felt that there was a great need for it. We established it, and today uh, it is operating quite well, and it is on the, uh, on the, uh, the beginning of extending.
Io spita il fiamme marica, mi pane e poste mi figa, con anetti stocchi fio, quando sono metà il surdio, o para passo un po' gli anni, e la fine ad essere cani, se so fissi e adora qui, ma se non se ne accorre qui. Well, properties are handed down to the eldest daughter, which I found quite amazing because I thought they're always handed down to the eldest son. <laughs> so my mother was the eldest daughter in her family and she got her house, which will then be handed down to me, which uh, I just thought was amazing because it just doesn't happen, you know, and everything else is based on the male, not the female. An attractive pick at the house, so, isn't it? Oh, it's very nice, you know, if your house is intact, that is, yeah. which mine is, and uh, I'm very lucky to be able to go back and see things and take photos and show my mother, and she says, I don't believe that's still standing, and the little old man says, I've extended your property. He says, I've planted, you know, broad beans on this side, and I've planted this on this side, and I think, oh, that's wonderful. I start fixing mine, but according to the fancy custom. The house you got there, it goes to dairy to your first sister. And when I went in 75, just after Janda fell, you know, I said, I'll spend a few up in, in the house. And I fixed the walls, put in two new balconies, and I put the uh, pear, water, it needs a bit more inside, but I write to my sister in office and she won't give me anything in right. I said, oh, you, I'm going to spend a couple of years with me. As you can see, we haven't got very much land. The land belongs to a lot of people, and the majority, they live all over the world, especially in Australia. You know, uh, I know it's difficult, because a lot of people, they say, oh, it's not the... The, va the value of the property, but it's the sentimental value they worry about, and they want to sell. But they have to think one thing along. Uh, if they really love Castellorizo and they want Castellorizo to progress, they must think one thing. Without sacrifices, you cannot go ahead. Now, if they're not willing to sell, if they're not, not willing to rebuild, if they're not willing to renovate, might as well just give it away to some who can do it. Everywhere you look, it's ruins. So, what do you get out of ruins? I tell you what do you get out of ruins, and we suffer, the ones who live here. They bring rats, snakes, scorpions, and also they give the opportunity to the people to go and dump the rubbish. And this is one of the reasons why we have so much in mosquitoes and flies in the island. Uh, well, I think the people who stay on, on the island resent the cages that have left because they left and they left these people to defend the island, to keep the island going. And the, and the, the cages that go there resent the locals too because they're living in our houses, they're occupying our land, you know, they're, they're, they're calling their, our houses theirs, you know, how dare they? The young ones, they're perfect. I love Castellanos. I haven't seen a young Australian or Australian or a young Australian born Greek who came here and didn't love it. They love it. They really love it. Uh, the older ones, they're a bit difficult. They expect too much. They're complaining about the accommodation, they're complaining about the facilities, they're complaining about the water, they're complaining about everything. So uh, they must understand one thing, as I said before, they have to make sacrifices themselves because we need help and we can't do it alone. We only 200 left in the island. Most of them they are old people and young children. So what can we do on our own? After 50 years, they come back here and they say, oh, look at my house, it's ruined. Of course it's ruined. You haven't done anything with your house for the past 50 years, so why should you expect the house to be in a perfect condition? 
And I know that that habit, that I have, that I kicking people out of the houses. A lot of houses have been kicked out. Lightly, and they don't do anything with the houses. They come here, I mean, look, if you live in Australia, and you come here every four, every five years, okay? And someone lives in the house. I mean, it doesn't make any sense at all. It doesn't matter. I think it's best if I help someone fixing up the house and make sure when they come here so they can stay in their own house as long as they're here on the holidays. It's very easy for us to go over there with pocketfuls of money and, uh, and pretend that we are uh, uh, the saviors of the world, you know, and, and find them there uh, with a chip on their shoulder and they have a right to have to be like they are because they're there maintaining what we hold so cl close and so dear to our heart. And I don't think that's very easy to do that. I have a, nothing but admiration for those people. I believe if you establish something that was proved to be uh, honest and proved to be uh, strong and proved to be authentic, I think you could get the rich Castor regions of Australia to contribute more than what they have so far. We are happy if, we, if someone from here is very great, you know, I mean, he's very big, money in business, also good doctors, we have a good doctor, so we are happy because it's came from here, for a little, so little place, makes so big people, I mean, great people. The Greeks live in abroad, and especially the television, they feel more Greeks than those living in Greece. This is, this is true. I mean, I, I don't believe that anybody could object to that. In Australia, like it or not, uh, foreigners, when I was small, was, were not accepted. And to come back here to Casaloso and find your roots or somewhere where you belong, even though we were Australian citizens, of course, uh, it was a really great feeling. Uh, mm -hmm. We came on the boat, and as it turned into the harbour, we all cried. I mean, we are second generation, it's just ridiculous. My opinion is that they face a very big problem of where they belong. As far as their roots are concerned, they're a bit Greek, and then again they may not be. And they're a bit Australian, which they may not be. I consider myself an Australian, but there was this Greek thing that was always um, sitting on my shoulder and, and uh, was always there, and, and so I was curious about it. And up until the time I went to Greece, I, for the first time, I, I, um, um, I had mixed feelings about Greece and my father because, well, he, you know, they, my parents were divorced, and um, I um, had that sort of problem of relating to a, a man who... Um, didn't fulfill all his paternal obligations and um, uh, so I had the, the, the thing of knowing I was uh, part Greek having a father over there um, but didn't have any direct connection with him um, I hadn't seen him since I was six I found that when the plane touched down in uh, Athens airport that uh, the moment it touched, I felt I had no choice. I had to see him. He could be two miles away, and I should, I should do something. So I set off for Kazi. You know, I threaded my way through all these hysterical Greeks, <laughs> and there was my father standing there puffing on this cig cigarette with a, a holder there that he, I vaguely remembered as a child he used to use, and uh, there he was, grey up, but. Um, just as erect and proud and strong as I, I, I could ever have expected. And uh, the first thing I noticed when I looked into his eyes was that they were the bluest blue eyes I'd ever seen. It was a strange thing. It was like I tried to analyze it. It was like uh, for all those years, it was like um, whatever was, was there was, it was dormant and, and meeting him was like connecting up a, um, a, a circuit or something and, and took me under his wing and showed me the island, pointed out various historic points, explained what the island was like in, in the past. He described it in, in great detail. 
at the same time I was hearing about all uh, about Australia and and what it was like in the 20s and the 30s and how um, he knew all these people in Australia like Squizzy Taylor and, and uh, um, um, Roy Reed and, and all this and I said how did you get to meet all these people and he said well in in, a, in English but um, with an accent he said uh, um, through the illegal gambling places that they, they used to be a, a meeting place for all these different people and so this vision of, of um, uh, Australia, Melbourne in the 20s was uh, very strong. One morning he just said come with me and we just went up a little alleyway there in the little cluster of houses near the water, near the, the um, promenade there and, and um, he took me upstairs into this little room and uh, he said I'll show you something and, and uh, he brought out this guitar with the mouth organ and, uh, and I thought oh that's right he does play guitar and he sings and all and he started to play and I um, I just sat there listening and it was such a sad, uh, sad feeling coming from it. It was, a, it was a lament. It was, it was lamenting things lost of loved ones, of relatives, of of, um, of the past. As he sang, I got all this, all these images and feelings, and uh, it was. Uh, um, very moving. The last morning I, I caught the, the big boat that went back and uh, um, I said goodbye to him and he, he uh, put on his hat and walked off up the mountains. I said, where are you going? He said, I'm, I'm uh, going camping. I, 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 wanna, I don't want to see the boat pull out and everybody go. And uh, I think he, 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 the island was, was uh, um, very much a symbol of him in a way and, and with all these people leaving he, he uh, found it difficult to, to deal with. So that was the last time I saw him. Yeah. He gave me a kiss on the cheek and said, be a good boy Georgie. <laughs> and uh, do as I say, not as I do. And, uh, and then he went, and that was the last time I saw him. He died two weeks later from a um, brain hemorrhage. And yet there are so many stories to tell. Castle Arisians can be found in all parts of the world, on all levels of society. And whatever our individual differences may be, we are all bound by the love of this island. It is our home, our history, a sanctuary and a symbol, a memory, <laughs> and perhaps even a myth. My family came, my family came from Castellorizo Been living in the land of Oz for 80 years or so They called them refs, they called them wogs, they called them so-and-sos But they survived the racist jobs for 80 years, you know Now my papu, he's 92, he watched the family grow It grew and grew and grew and grew, the Greeks like sex, you know My family came, the Cassies came from Castellorizo Been living in the land of Oz for 80 years or so From fish and chips and steak and eggs, they built their family home 
homes. On good Australian soil they built, they helped Australia grow. And in their homes, their souvenirs from Castellorizo, the hallowed map, the harbour view, the painted plates on show, and photographs, old photographs that told a tale of woe, of poverty and tyranny, under the bed they go. My family came, the Cassies came from Castellorizo, been living with the memories for 80 years or so. Their children grew, they went to school, they learnt the Aussie ways, they changed their clothes, they changed their talk, they even changed their names. But in the house the parents taught that Cassies they will stay, a Cassie born, a Cassie be, until their dying day. Cause everything that's Greek is good, it's always been that way, and Cassies are the best of all, my old yaya would say. My family came, the Cassies came from Castellorizo, been living in a time warp zone for 80 years or so. At weddings and at christenings they'd sing the Cassie songs, we did the Cassie dances and we all would sing along. And all the stories you would hear about this Grecian isle would put it on a pedestal, a faultless pure lifestyle. But reality as time goes by gets twisted, warped and changed. And the longer they had been here, the bigger the myth became. My family came, the Cassies came from Castellorizo, been living in the past too long for 80 years or so. The myth of Castellorizo, so good, so Greek, so great, to live by myth in a changing world simply does not equate. Cause no man can an island be, the proverb wisely states, and progress never comes to those, to those who sit and wait. And so we see the culture clash, worship of myth creates. You can't live in another time, another mental state. My family came, my family stayed in Castellorizo. Been living with the myth too long for 80 years or so. The Cassies came, the Cassies stayed in Castellorizo. They left reality behind some 80 years ago. We are of the earth, you know. I'm a biologist. And we think that we are detached from the earth. We have this idea that we are so powerful as human beings. Our molecules are just parts of the earth that have come together. We are as much part of the earth as we are of each other, let alone you know, other members of the animal kingdom. So when one comes back to one's roots and one's origins, of course there is an identity and a feeling of one with that particular place. Υπερήφανος είμαι από τη μια πλευρά για τους καστελοριδιούς τους εκτός του νησιού τους. I am proud of the expatriate Castellorisians. They prosper, they get rich, gain an education. And we admire them, we are happy and proud for them. But we're a bit sad as well because they might remember Castellorizo, cry for it, talk about it, but they don't help it financially. Δεν βοηθάνε γι' αυτό υλικά. Ναι. Είχε ένα παπά κάποτε. There was a very conscientious but very poor priest once who used to tell his congregation at the end of the sermon you should look after your priest. So everyone would lean forward and look at him whereupon he'd say not through your eyes, through your pockets. Γι' αυτό κι εγώ σε τραγουδώ και άρχισε ρε τι δω Θέλω και με το θάνατο Με σε να τριγυρίζω Θέλω και με το θάνατο Σε σε να τριγυρίζω Γι' αυτό κι εγώ σε τραγουδώ Μη συγχαρεί το μένω Να μένεις πάντα θάνατο Στον κόσμο δοξασμένο Να μένεις πάντα θάνατο